So how are you doing, everyone? Welcome, first of all, to Rapid7. It's great to have you all here. So we've got a little bit of a different talk for you today. Um, now, I want to set a few, a few boundaries of what this talk is. This talk is not a comparison between products. That's very important. We're going to talk a lot about Amazon Lambda, but really what we're trying to do here is try and show a journey where we had to make some tough choices and tough decisions and why we made them. And hopefully at the end, you'll be like, oh, that kind of makes sense. Maybe we'll do the same. So before that, we should really introduce ourselves. So my name is Ryan Williams. I'm a software engineer here at Rapid7. Uh, I've been in the company for about nine years. I've been lucky enough to work in a few different areas, but um, I mostly work in our platform and shared services. And this is... Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lars. Uh, I'm a principal engineer, and I've been working here for roughly four years, uh, primarily focused on uh, anything APIs and backend, currently working within uh, vulnerability management, really focusing on how we can manage the complexity of the, our data as we grow. So let's jump into the agenda. So what we're going to do in this talk is, uh, is a little bit different. We're, we're going to take you on a journey to really explore what does serverless mean for us at Rapid7? So we're going to start with something that we're calling the serverless gold rush, which is essentially like how it all started. And we're going to cover how you know we might have dug a little bit too deep and the growing pains that cost as we scaled. Finally, we're going to talk about how we escaped the mines, uh, reevaluated and iterated our patterns and architecture, grabbed our pickaxes, went straight back in, and you know started harvesting those those gold nuggets there. Um, then finally, at the end, what we're going to do is give a little bit of a summary and a conclusion of what we've done, and really, like, hopefully, we really hope that the takeaway that you'll have from this is, you know, like. Why did the path that we take work for us? What benefits did we have? And what can you really learn as you scale uh, yourself? And, um, and as AI is taking over the world, we have lots of lovely AI generated images for you as we go along. Exactly. Right. So, so why are we calling it the serverless gold rush? Right. So to give a little bit of context, uh, Rapid7 started as uh, essentially an on-premise offering. And you know, the markets are changing. You know, we needed to go to the cloud. And we already had a lot of complexity to deal with, and we knew that we didn't want to add another set of, of problems. So really, what we needed was something simple that just worked. We didn't want to have to worry about managing infrastructure, you know, hiring 100 sysadmins to deal with all of these things uh, to make sure that we're successful. So how, 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 how do we do that, Ryan? Well, like Lars said, is we, we started our, our cloud experience with none. We had no idea what we were doing. Um, this is back a number of years ago now, probably going back six, seven years. So we needed it to be simple. The reason we needed it to be simple is literally because we had literally no idea what we were doing. So Lambda really suited us. We, as developers of Rapid7, you kind of manage the whole spectrum. We have great tooling, we have tooling teams, but really we deploy our code, we build our code and deploy it ourselves. So it was really, really important. As we were a hyper growth company and we're still growing very quickly, what really mattered was high availability. And the reason I say that is we're a security company and we had to be available when customers needed us. So it was very, very important that high availability was on default and we needed architecture to scale seamlessly. Like literally every day we were getting a thousand more requests, 10,000 more requests, 100,000 more requests. So Lambda really, really suited us. So should we talk a little bit about our scale and how we use serverless? So we first adopted serverless back in sort of 2015. Um, now Lambda came out about 2014, I think. So we were quite early adopters of Lambda and now in Belfast especially, we're mostly a Java house. So we have a lot of Java lambdas. We have a bit of, bit of Python, a bit of Go, but we are mostly a, a lambda house of Java. So over the next five years, we really start adopting a lot more serverless applications. We did serverless MSK, DynamoDB, SNS, SQS, and S3. And to be quite honest, this is just to really highlight how much we use Amazon and how much Jeff probably really loves us. So what kind of scale do we have? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we're, we're running at very, very high scale. So we are currently servicing six regions. And at peak, we have 2 billion Lambda invocations an hour, 500 million SES requests an hour. And we're currently storing roughly 17 petabytes of that on S3, right? These are, these are massive numbers. And we would never have been able to get to the scale if we haven't, hadn't actually adopted all of these managed uh, serverless offerings. That's true. And one thing to really highlight is we're still doing 2 billion Lambda invocations and we've moved a huge workload off Lambda. And we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about why we had to move it off Lambda. Right. Uh, yeah, so we had great success, right? But there were some problems, right? Uh, the problem for us was really that while we scaled seamlessly and were able to you know, deploy things and everything was great, 
there was one constant that we couldn't really solve, and that was our cost was increasing very, very quickly. Like our infrastructure bill like exploded. And we didn't really understand why at first. But you know, as, as things changed and our traffic patterns changed, we started realizing that the, the, the type of compute that we were really using was, you know, it, we, we essentially paid a premium for this for the simplicity. We started looking into how to solve it. And it was it was quite a journey, um, which we're covering in, in this section here. And what's quite interesting is at this time, we were also adding many, many customers. So you might think, oh, it's great. You're adding more and more customers. They're paying you more and more money. Sure, just pay for the infrastructure costs. But they weren't scaling the same. Our infrastructure was scaling at a much higher rate than our revenue was. And we had to work out why. So this section is called When We Dug Too Deep. Now, why we call it this is because everything looked great for a developer. We looked at our metrics. Everything looked great. Everything was scaling beautifully. No timeouts. We just seen huge, huge numbers. And we were like, what's going on here? Like, I'm a developer. I'm not getting alerted. Everything looks really great. But traffic patterns changed. So this is really important for us. At first, when we first got to the cloud and we first used Lambda, there was one constant. We always hit zero. Now, we may scale to massive numbers. We may have scaled huge numbers. But at the end of the day, we always came back to zero. And then we went again, much like a heartbeat. But then all of a sudden, we never went back to zero. For 24 hours a day, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, all of a sudden, our baseline changed to a much higher baseline. And what really happened is we got a wave of, the, of traffic. So we never went to zero. Then all of a sudden, this wave came along. Now, what we tried to do is we tried to fix this, much like you just heard in the talk before. We, we tweaked everything in Lambda. We tweaked the memory. We tweaked the CPUs, the sizes of them. We changed code, but we just couldn't get the cost under control. So we had to make a change. Exactly. So, so you know, when you're a startup or a scale-up company, uh, the pay-as-you-go model, it works beautifully, right? You scale up, you scale down, you have a little bit of silence, and you essentially pay nothing for these silent periods. But as your, your company grows and your systems start getting under pressure, your, your baseline is increasing. So this is the key, really, and it's, it's really simple. It's just the fact that this baseline change means that you're always paying a premium. And since our traffic is not much more predictable, do we really need this kind of elasticity uh, down to zero? Because that's, that's really what changed for us. And you know, we, we realized that we needed to, to, to make a change here because uh, obviously this wasn't sustainable for us. And uh, there's another key here, and that is that what, what is this, what is this, uh, this premium compute? Why, why did our baseline change like this, right? And that is really the workloads that we're running. So what's really interesting here is we're still running 2 billion of these an hour. So we're not changing the wee, the wee graph at the start that goes up and down to zero. We're still running that rapid seven today, and we're never going to change that. What we're really concentrating on is how can we optimize for the section that never goes to zero, but still keeping the serverless mind step, keep, keeping that ideology, keeping those ideas. How are we going to do this? So the first thing we had to actually think about was, well, where does Lambda suck? Yeah. I mean, obviously... The key here is we want the simplicity of the Lambda model, right? Because it's beautiful. You deploy it and it just runs and it scales seamlessly. But as we you know, grew as a company, bought new companies and developed new in-house capabilities, we needed to be able to have more varied workloads. And you know, we, we kind of started with like, a, we're just going to do everything with Lambdas. And obviously, then you start hitting certain you know, ceilings. You, know, you might run out of memory. You exceed your runtime or you need more concurrent invocations that is, that is possible because at some point, we needed to start supporting ETL pipelines, batch and stream processing, and so on. And this is a very different type of workload. And a workload that doesn't really fit this kind of Lambda model. But again, I'm sitting here going, I still want to use Lambda. I really, really want to use Lambda. So, well, what we had to do? Well, we had to escape from our mind because we had to have a think, how are we going to re-architecture? So what we said there is we want, we want to control cost. But I also want a great developer experience because I'm a lazy developer. I like things to be simple. I still want to be able to use all of the compute Amazon has to offer. And I think that's a really key important. Like the thing we have for Amazon Lambda is that you don't get to choose the compute it runs on. You just know it works, which on one hand you think that's great. But when you're running, when you're running so many invocations, you kind of go, well, I do want to know what compute it's running on. You know, I do want to know that I'm getting the cheapest bang for a buck I can. So we decided, well, we're going to have to try and make this. Basically, we're going to make Lambda again with a few more bells and whistles. So how does that look? Yeah, so obviously, we want, 
really what we want is for the majority of developers to have the kind of same experience that we had in you know our golden early days, right? Of just, it's just simple, it just works. But there is a trade-off to be made here, right? Because we do need the simplicity, but a lot of the products that are off there, you lose control, right? Like even in the previous talk, right? We talked about how, you know, there's all, there's all this magic that you got to tune. And this is the kind of thing that really, really stopped us in our tracks. And our solution for that is really thinking of a serverless as a pattern. It's, it's really a pattern to retain velocity as we're growing, right? We need to be able to abstract away compute so that we get the things that really matter, right? A simple model for developers to say, I need to run this and I don't care where it is so that we can focus on the underlying compute layer so that we can optimize for cost, for high availability, fault tolerance, and any other improvements that we want to make for the future. So Ryan, what do we do to make this pay off for us? Well, firstly, I like to think that Amazon Lambda had a pattern like this somewhere on a wall when they, they made Lambda. <laughs> but really, like this, what this diagram is really trying to emphasize is we see the importance of a developer not worrying about the compute layer. We, we honestly think the orchestration layer is the only thing developers should care about. I've built it. I've built it in a certain way. Send it to my orchestration layer, and you take care of it. So Basically the building our own Lambdas. <laughs> so the next slide is we're going to show you what we did to solve this. Now, this is live in production today. We've moved this. We're in. This is rolled out actually quite, quite large in Rapid7. So what do we do? I know this is going to be the dreaded word Kubernetes, but we're not going to talk about Kubernetes because it's really not interesting. But the reason we have Kubernetes is because, one, we needed a good development experience. So that was containers. We chose containers for that experience. But the most important part of this whole diagram is how we organized our compute. The compute was king. We, we needed a way of finding out how can I get the cheapest CPU core from Amazon? You know, Amazon have lots of different ways of getting compute. You have spot pricing, you have reserved instances, you have um, savings plans, and you literally have hundreds and hundreds of different machines. So we really needed a way of saying, well, actually, I want to pay as little as I can for the cores that I have, please, because I know I'm going to run these 24 hours a day and it's going to cost me millions to run this. So how do we do that? Yeah, exactly. So and you, see, you see this pretty box there that says Carpenter. Um, that is at the heart of a lot of the things that we do. And Carpenter is essentially a project by Amazon, uh, which is responsible for just making sure we provision the right servers at the right time. And it's, it's actually pretty simple, right? There's a lot of Amazon APIs where you can say, you know, ask for what is the current cost of this instance on spot, what is the on-demand price of this instance, so on. Because the key here is that we don't care about the servers, but this technology does, right? And there's two main categories that we are saving money on. So one of them is pick the cheapest compute available because we don't care. And the second one is making sure that we're efficiently using that compute, right? Really, we want our machines to be running at like 80% CPU utilization. So obviously there's two parts, right? Carpenter gets the compute, but how does it decide on what compute it needs to actually get for you? And what it does there is it looks at the current running configuration whenever there's a new thing coming in and says, OK, how can I consolidate and figure out what is the most optimal configuration to run this in? So imagine, for example, a developer comes in and says, I need to run this workload. I need two cores, 500 megabytes of memory. Another developer comes in, has slightly different requirements. And suddenly, there's hundreds of services right, all asking for resources from this cluster. So what Carpenter then does is it says, all right, I need to take all these things and I need to play this game of Tetris of essentially just you know, fitting things into these boxes to make sure we can run all these workloads. So from the developer point of view, they don't see this happening, right? They're simply deploying things in, but you do get to retain this control of running many different kinds of varied workloads, which is just beautiful, right? There's obviously a lot of things that we're not covering here, which I, I just is worth mentioning. You know, we deploy our monitoring agents in there, auto scalers on queues, um, yeah, all, all, all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's 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 really nice. Now, one thing we should just point out straight away: we were very early adopters of Carpenter. Like we we actually talked to Carpenter developers. So Carpenter is not even on version one, and we really push it to its limits of how we use it, and how we embrace it. But I suppose the question you're all asking is: Did it even work? because we weren't sure, to be honest, at first. So let's go back into the mine, and we'll, we'll have a look. Well, to be quite honest, we have a lovely dwarfing our costs. Uh, we saved millions. We, we literally saved millions um, by doing this. And you can kind of see why. Now, all of a sudden, the complete market of compute was open to us. We weren't limited by a product giving us a set price. We weren't limited by having to try and change memory to get the best out of a certain product. We were in control. 
And now we went to extreme that it wasn't always perfect. We went to extremes of limiting certain families of compute that didn't really work. But overall, we did really, really well. Yeah, and I think I think I really want to emphasize how one of the key things we've done here is we've automated decision making, right? So whenever so Carpenter is essentially sitting there deciding on what compute that you're getting, right? And that means that whenever Amazon releases a new instance, like a next generation instance or makes some optimizations, we don't actually have to go in and intervene because Carpenter is just going to pick it, which means that we actually see very interesting trends in our, our, our billing where you know, certain times we have our costs actually drop, although we didn't really do anything. And this is really helping free up you know, engineering resources to focus on actually developing product capabilities. So that allows us to sustainably scale with our customer base. And it's funny because I'm not actually a big fan of uh, Kubernetes. And the, one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of it is because normally when you deploy Kubernetes, you are very limited into your compute layer. You basically set up with like a few M4s, a few C5s or whatever your computers. That's basically it. And then you kind of say, oh, well, next day we're going to do an upgrade and it's very expensive and it's timely. But we actually seen this in real life this week or last week where um, Amazon released the R7Gs, which is basically just another instance type. But all, all, already we've seen it being deployed in our cluster, already being used for our compute straight away of having to do nothing, which I think is pretty impressive. And nicely, it just scales for us. And the more the more pressure it gets under, the more it scales and it just works nicely like, like Lambda. But we're going to be honest. Yes, obviously, there are no silver bullets, right? Um, there's a lot of reasons why this has been possible for us, right? We, we are a big company and we have a lot of resources and people that help out. For example, we have an entire department called Platform Delivery who manage you know, our CI and CD pipelines and setting really like setting golden standards for developers to follow, right? So the, the initial upfront cost of a lot of what we've done is actually fairly high. And you know, obviously you, you really only get this benefit at scale, but if, for example, we still use Amazon Lambda. So like we got to the point where Amazon specifically provisioned a dedicated Lambda rack just for us because we were such heavy users, right? Um, it's just about picking the right tool for the job, right? We're still using it, 2 billion, uh, and we're constantly evolving and learning as we go. But this, these technologies and the way things are moving right now, is, is, it's extremely exciting. And I think in, you know, in a few years, we're going to see a lot of really nice changes for, to help us all manage all this complexity. So that's really it. So really our takeaway from our talk is how the serverless pattern, the serverless biology has crossed into now architecture of other systems. You know, we took, we took those patterns when we were developing new architectures and we said, well, can we use that over here? Or do I just need to go back to EC2 because I can't get this to work properly? And thankfully, we actually were able to find a way. So we hope you found that interesting. And if you have any questions, we'll take them. If not, this talk could literally take about three hours if you really wanted it to. We could talk about three hours just on Calm to alone. Um, I advise you, if you haven't seen it, you should go see it, you should have a play with it. It's genuinely really good. Like I said before, it's a little bit buggy, but it is getting a lot more stable. Um, hopefully, they'll get version one out soon enough. But we've had great success with it. So thank you very much. Thank you.